Welcome to the Psychology World Podcast. I'm Connor Whiteley, bringing you with psychology news, articles and other interesting psychology related articles. Here where I can find the podcast notes and more interesting psychology related things and here I can get your free 8 psychology book box set at connorwhiteley.net. Now let's get on to the show. Hi everyone and welcome to episode 116 of the Psychology World Podcast with me Con Whiteley. And today's episode is on how do 100 year olds keep their minds sharp. So this is an absolutely brilliant cog- um, cognitive psychology episode. I absolutely love device and it's because it was really interesting to go into some of the research behind, yeah, but like, behind like how some 100 year olds do actually keep their minds very sharp, just their as you as sharp as young people so and i actually think it's really brilliant that it's actually quite a hopeful episode because this really does show that um just because you age it does not mean that you start to lose your cognitive ability so i really do love today's episode hopefully you will too and there are so many great lessons we can learn from this episode so really just listen to it enjoy it and i don't know maybe even try and adopt some of these lessons now just so you can last a bit longer when you're in your old age because as you're here I know I definitely am so just have fun with today's episode. So moving on to psychology news section we've been from the British Psychological Society Research Digest and there's very some sort of like exciting ones because this does tie into what I'm doing on my placement for example the first one. Scared of spiders there's an app for that. <laughs> Specific phobias are incredibly common. According to estimates, around 3-15% to of people will develop one in their lifetime, the majority of whom won't seek treatment. Phobias can manifest around a huge number of stimuli, such as lighting, dentists, and most commonly animals, such as spiders. Although exposure therapy is well established and is very effective at reducing fear and anxiety in those with specific phobias, not many end up accessing a treatment. Unsurprisingly, the certainty of being exposed to terrifying things doesn't entice many people. Those who do make it to a therapeutic setting are also quite likely to drop out due to extreme fear caused by these controlled exposures. However, modern technology may help us to sidestep these issues entirely. A new study suggests a solution may, may align augmented reality. And because of my placement and it's to do with M Health apps, these are like, um mental health mobile apps that are used to treat people you know, like people and like these are behavioral interventions for example like CBT and other cognitive well, and other psychotherapies and this is just an extension of it so I'm really interested in this and and I haven't actually thought about it but what I might do is I might save this and actually see if I can use it in my literature though so <laughs> yes yeah, so like I might like do that though but yes but in all honesty this just shows how much psychology is actually coming along though because I think we're finally at this point where technology is becoming good enough and there's more of a research consensus that technology can actually be useful to us and that in technology isn't this bad evil thing that will destroy us and all yes and all those really negative traditional of those so really really exciting for the future and hopefully yeah, this will only become more yeah but like a more like a white spread because whilst these apps aren't perfect and whilst i will always always encourage people to go and see professional in-person face-to-face psychotherapies all of this like mobile health um, teletherapy stuff is actually going to become a lot more common and a lot more useful to us in the years to come. A jerkle when hides emotion. Research on anger digested. <laughs> I like how I did that quite dramatically. <laughs> okay then. At times, it feels that the world is um, a washer with anger. From the streets of Taliban-controlled Afghanistan to any form of a social media you will care to mention, anger and outrage are increasingly uh, um, everywhere. New research helps to reveal why this is. It also reveals anger to be a self jekyll and hide emotion. If we can rid ourselves of the dark, destructive side, what is left can actually be a force for good. And I'm actually going to have to like click onto this because I go into like um, emotions like anger, rage, and uh, all of those ne- like negative emotions in my books, and I have spoken about them before on the podcast. But it's the way how they described it: a Jekyll and Hyde emotion. And this couldn't be more true because if we think about it, about it, we are all normal people, and, and like which one is the normal kind one? I think it's Mr. Jekyll, but I'm not sure. But like any way though, so um, all of us are kind, normal people. 
But when we get angry, that's when our destructive dark side comes out. So it's a very good analogy. And anger is actually a really interesting topic to talk about it. I've definitely spoken about it on other podcasts before, so you might want to check the backlist. But if you want a more in a depth look, then I talk about it in social psychology. I definitely talk about it in there. And I probably talk about it in the emotion chapters in cognitive psychology. And the last one is, we're more likely to steal from large groups than from individuals. We're all aware of the financial disparity that plagues our economic systems. Many of those at the top of large corporations seem content to exploit large groups of people for their own significant financial gain. Strangely, this is somewhat at odds with a previous research in behavioural economics, which tends to find that people are generally quite pro-social, honest and overall unwilling to steal considerable amounts from others. From results like these, it's difficult to piece together exactly how we've arrived at such levels of financial inequality. Psychologists have floated a number of potential explanations for this phenomenon. Perhaps those who end up rich have innately higher levels of of psychopathy, for example, or perhaps it's the case where the cultural norms within certain businesses change at the way people make economic decisions. However, new research suggests an alternative explanation. When it comes to acting selfishly, we are more likely to do it at a grand scale rather than a small one. So there are lots of different thoughts and opinions that I have on this one. But the main one is, is that I don't necessarily agree with that the rich people always have higher higher levels of like psychopathy. Because I know basically a like millionaire author and I yes, and I do online classes from him and his wife. But he is far from, to be honest, I think he's one of the most normal people on the planet. And yes, I know like the uh, cliche, yes, like people with high levels of like psychopathy, psychopaths, etc. They're always like really like, normal people, but I don't necessarily agree with that. But overall, though, well, like, there are so many different ways uh, and there's so many different explanations for, for this that it is really difficult to like, pinpoint. So I'm actually going to come back to one of my soapboxes, which is you've always got to do holistic research. None of these reasons will be correct by them themselves. That's just how psychology works, is how behaviour works. But if you look at these holistically, you will probably find that different explanations are true to different extents, depending on the situational factors and other factors that play. Yeah, but that like play a role like in you know, this. For example, for the personality traits and the personality factors that were like factors that were some all in all, there was no easy answer to about this. So I really hope that you enjoy the psychology news section. So let's move on to the personal update. So in the last section, I forgot to mention that it is Friday the 15th of October 2021 as I record this. Also, I sometimes I get asked, why do I date these podcast episodes? Why does it matter? Or like, why do I always make sure that I do try and date these when I remember? And the entire point is that I quite like to date them simply because of the future listeners and also though like I thought your selves because I could say something like in like this episode but then I might like learn more in like a few years time and I might actually change my opinion on it that way so like I just you I can see like there's a clear change of opinion and also though of like some of these episodes if the podcast continues of like another um five ten years which it may <laughs> Well, I like never know. Then you'll, you'll probably find that some of these will actually be come like quite dated, and also though, like some of these episodes and like some of these findings, we might like listen to them in like ten years' time, and like we'll think, oh my god, we used to believe that. I can't believe that. Why? Well, yeah, well, like why were we so silly to believe that X caused Y when we now know that A, B, and C interact to cause D? Or I don't know. I really really just I don't know but it's just something like that yes like that's why I always try and date these so moving on to the person update in all honesty in terms of my placement there's been nothing major like this week because I've just been like continuing with the literature review I've basically I've, like done it now so I've sent it off to my placement supervisor just so they can like look over it suggest some in improvements that must like and next week I'll like I'll continue with like formatting it and then I'll like do the in improvements of like when he gets back to me yeah so but plus that there's a yeah but like there's nothing like that interesting but for the first time ever I suffered from FOMO for like this week fear of a missing out and I talk a lot more about this in uh, the reflective writing placement book that I'm doing though like, for you guys and also like for my coursework 
basically I've, I've been getting a lot more into like LinkedIn per my supervisors um, in instructions and I've been seeing tons of people doing their placements really enjoying it because they've been working at like hospitals and all the really really cool really interesting placement ideas though and I started to feel a bit ah oh, but I didn't like get to do that I'm doing an academic placement I could be doing hospital I could be interacting with the people I could be improving lives and all of that stuff so that lasted for about a, like, a day or two until I was having a, a conversation with someone though and then when they pointed out that they're probably suffering from well, yeah, well, like, from like FOMO I was thinking oh yeah true that and then that, con- yes, and then that conversation sort of like went on and I was thinking I've actually got the perfect placement because because it's so flexible I can fit in with my life and like what I do for example my placement will always always be my priority but I get to podcast, I get to write, I get to interact with all of you wonderful people who will like email me, tweet me on Twitter and ever yes, and like everything else though. So there's just so many great things that this placement has actually like given to me. And also though, it means that my academic writing has been approved. So I'm really pleased like, about that. And the reason why I'm telling you this is it's just that FOMO. It's a part of life for yeah but like whether you're like a a psychology student a psychology professional we are going to experience FOMO at like some points though because I've like someone's got the better grades someone's doing the better learning opportunity someone's got a better job people are always going to do that but it's part of life and we just need to take a moment and think yeah the positives of our lives and not dreaming about someone else's life so where that's sort of the unofficial tip of the week (laughs) And as always, I always like love to hear your thoughts and feelings on today's episode. So you can always email me, conwhitely at conwhitely.net. You can always tweet me on Twitter at sci-fi whitely. And you can always leave a comment at the show notes at conwhitely.net forward slash podcast. I always love to hear from all of you. And today's episode has been sponsored by Cognitive Psychology, a guide to neuropsychology, neuroscience and cognitive psychology. So I cannot recommend this great book enough because if you love today's episode, then you really are going to enjoy this great engaging book that's really easy to understand. Uh, yeah, but like, um, because of this will really help you understand cognitive psychology, which is all about our mental processes. So where uh, this great book looks at the stuff like memory, thinking of biases, uh, dementia and tons of other great cognitive cognitive processes which we really like rely on and these really do affect our behaviours. And this great third edition focuses on neuroscience ever so it really does focus on more of the brain side and how it impacts our behaviour though. So I cannot recommend this a great a book enough. So that is cognitive psychology, a guide to neuropsychology, neuroscience and cognitive psychology third edition. So I cannot recommend this a great book enough. And you can buy it from all the major ebook retailers and you can order the Paypack and the large print versions from Amazon, your local bookstore or local library if you request it. And you can buy the ebook directly from me at payhip.com forward slash Connor Whiteley. So let's move on to the content part of today's episode. So we're moving on to the content part of today's episode. So we're going to be talking about the absolute brilliant topic of how do 100 years old keep their mind sharp. So this is an absolutely brilliant episode that I really did enjoy like writing about and actually like recording. So with 15% of people over the age of 70 experience some form of a dementia, with this increasing to 35% in over 90s, we need to understand how people get dementia and others don't. Some people over 100 don't experience a dementia or any sort of a cognitive decline and they're just as sharp as their younger people. So that's the focus of this great episode. So how do they do this? After experiencing a personal loss to, to dementia in early 2021, where someone in my family passed away from dementia, I really do know the damaging effects that, that it can have on a person and a family. Because the thing about dementia is that it doesn't just steal that person's life and well, life over, but it actually steal the lives of the other families, especially their other half who ends up caring for them. So I do have an interest in making sure that I and others don't have a dementia. Especially as I want to be writing, living and maybe podcasting until I die. And that all relies on my mind, so I don't want to lose it. Which is where this new study comes in. And about podcasting until I'm like um, 90 or until I'm like 100. Wow, I can't even... Oh, to be honest, would a podcasting even be a thing well, a thing like in 100 years? Oh, oh, yeah, that's actually quite interesting to think about. Okay, so giving it back to the article. Burka, Gaza and all 2001. 
So these researchers from the Netherlands wanted to examine what some 100 years old were doing to keep their minds sharp. Therefore, they examined over 330 100 years old who had their carers like couldn't affirm that they were mentally sharp. Following this, the participants underwent extensive testing that tested a lot of different cognitive abilities, for example, verbal reasoning, processing speed, attention, and much more. Afterwards, the researchers collected the participants' health, sight, hearing, and more physical data points. Then, they followed the participants in there till they died, or they were no longer able to participate in the study. With their results showing some very amazing results because none, because none of the participants experienced any major loss in their cognitive abilities except for some slight losses in the short term memory but everything else was still intact. But what's even more amazing though is that after they died 44 participants had autopsies and they had the typical signs in their brains for Alzheimer's. For example, yeah, for the amount of like, platelets in their brain, the results show that despite there being a signs of Alzheimer's in other brains, none of the participants showed any signs or symptoms of Alzheimer's in their behaviour or in their cognition. And then the same goes for people who had an increased risk of other condition due to genetic factors. Conclusion and real world implications. Whilst the researchers weren't able to draw any firm conclusions from this study, there were a number of tips that they could draw out that contributed to these people's cognitive resilience that allows them to resist the effects of further condition. The first factor was that most of them well, yeah, but that most of them had a high level of that education, with most of them are going to university and they're getting a degree. And then out of um, these are people well, by over half of them that still lived independently. So I think that this just to go show the importance of learning throughout life and enjoying learning. So you'll probably get a lot of like benefits from like reading books, listening to this podcast, and watching documentaries, and uh, and so on. Another factor was most of the participants had the good vision and hearing abilities, which is important because when people lose these abilities, then they lose social connections, and by extension, they cannot process as much information because it's simply like not there, leading to cognitive decline. Finally, the participants were physically fit, with over 75% of the participants being able to walk independently at the beginning of the study. Whilst there were no firm conclusions from the study that are going to like 100% work, that will work, these amazing 100 years old were able to help us find um, possible leads for future research and the possible ideas about how to make sure that we don't suffer cognitive decline in old age. Personally though, and this is what I'm taking from today's episode, is that I'm going to keep learning exercising throughout my life, just to increase the chance of me being okay in late in that later life. So of course, nothing on the podcast is ever like official advice, but you might have learned something today that way. So I really hope that you enjoyed today's episode, and that you got something out of it, and I really do think that this is really important though. And if you know someone who would enjoy today's episode, then please tell them about it. I'm always really grateful when you wonderful people help us spread the word about the podcast. And please check out Cognitive Psychology, a guide to neuroscience, neuropsychology and cognitive psychology. It's a great book that I cannot recommend and it really does dive into a today's episode in a lot more depth over. Well, depth over. So it's available in like all of the usual places. So have a great day everyone and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to see the show notes, then please go to connorwhitesley.net. And if you want a free Ada book psychology box set, then please go to connorwhitesley.net. Have a great day and I'll see you next time.